Welcome to the People Who Read People podcast with me, Zach Elwood. This is a podcast aimed at better understanding other people and better understanding ourselves. You can learn more about it at behavior-podcast.com. And if you like the work I do and want to support it, you can sign up on that site for a premium subscription that gets you ad-free episodes, amongst other things. As you probably know, if you've listened to this podcast before, I sometimes focus on topics related to political polarization. I've written a book on that topic called Diffusing American Anger, which you can learn more about at American-Anger.com. And I've got a Substack newsletter you can sign up for if you want to keep up with my depolarization-related work. On this episode, I talk to Rich Logis. His last name is spelled L-O-G-I-S. Rich is a former Trump supporter. You can find a lot of work online that he wrote from his time as a pro-Trump political activist. He's written pieces for The Federalist and other conservative outlets. He had a podcast called The Rich Logis Show, where he talked about his political beliefs. He volunteered in various ways for pro-Trump causes. In 2021, he underwent a big shift, and as he puts it, he went from ultra-mega to never-Trump. I met Rich at the Braver Angels conference earlier this year. Braver Angels is an organization aimed at political depolarization. A couple episodes ago, I interviewed their co-founder, Bill Doherty, who also happens to be a couples therapist. I wanted to talk to Rich Logis for a couple reasons. For one, he's interested in bridging divides and in depolarization. As a Trump supporter, he was very high animosity. He had a lot of anger towards liberals and the powers that be in general. So I wanted to understand his white-hot rage and what it was directed at. And I wanted to understand how that changed. If you're a Trump voter, you might see it as unfair or biased that I'd interview an ex-Trump supporter. You may think that if I wanted to understand a Trump supporter perspective, I should interview a current Trump supporter. But to be completely honest, I think to be an enthusiastic supporter of Donald Trump, you have to have a lot of us versus them animosity and anger. Trump is someone who fundamentally attempts to divide us into us and them. He has spoken in that language for years now. He speaks in terms of real Americans and the Democrats who want to destroy America and similar framings. His language and the language of the people who create his emails and other communications is textbook polarizing. This is not to say I think all Trump voters are unreasonable or irrational or divisive people. I don't. I separate my views of Trump from my views of people who vote for him. And I think that's an important distinction. This is also not to say I would not interview a current Trump supporter. I might. I'd be theoretically interested. But this is just to say why I wanted to interview Rich, because he's someone who went from being filled with white-hot rage to no longer having that rage. And I'm someone who wants to lessen people's rage. In talking to Rich privately, he describes his conversion as almost spiritual, and that he feels more at peace with things and more emotionally healthy. If you disagree with me on these points, if you're an enthusiastic Trump supporter and you're someone who wants to reduce us versus them animosity in America, please reach out to me and email me via my website and let me know how you view these things or what I'm getting wrong. I do realize no large group is all the same, so I like hearing from people who don't fit my general stereotypes. And my focus on Trump and Trump support in this episode is also not to say that there isn't unreasonable animosity on the left. I've examined some liberal side divisive beliefs and approaches in this podcast and in my book. The fundamental nature of conflict is that it makes many of us very us versus them in our thinking. And for liberal people listening who might be thinking, why do we want to hear what another Trump voter thinks or what he once thought? Haven't we heard enough of that? I'd argue that we actually haven't heard that much good analysis of what drove support for Trump. I talk about this in my book, that there is often a tendency in the liberal-leaning media to focus on the most irrational, most foolish, or most bigoted rationale for Trump support, or to filter for the worst-case interpretations of the motivations for that support. And I'm fully aware of some of the darker aspects of Trump support. One of the first political pieces I wrote was an examination of the views of a white nationalist Trump voter who I personally know. So this is to say that I'm aware of those kinds of things, but I think what is missing from a lot of liberal-leaning coverage is the more rational, more understandable views that many Trump voters had. So that's what I wanted to dig into with Rich, and I was curious to ask him about some things I wrote about in my book on that. And not only that, I think there is a general failure in a lot of media coverage to take into account the basic concepts of polarization and conflict. 
For example, how the very nature of extreme conflict can make us think the worst of our political opponents and can make us view things through an extremely pessimistic, sky-is-falling type lens and can make us be tolerant of bad things people on our side do and say simply because we feel we're at war. One of the reasons I have focused so much on polarization topics is because I've been disappointed in mainstream journalism, not talking more about the meta-level concepts of how conflict basically messes with our minds and distorts our thinking. Conflict makes many of us irrational and overly emotional, and prone to simplistic views and narratives. So those are also some things I wanted to talk to Rich about. Rich Logis has a project he's working on now called Perfect Our Union. You can learn more about him and his work at perfectourunion.us. You can follow Rich on Twitter at Perfect Our Union. Okay, here's the talk with Rich Logis. Hey, Rich. Thanks for coming on the show. Hey, Zach. Good evening and welcome everyone out there listening. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thanks for taking time. I know you're a busy person who has a lot of things you're, you're working on, so I, I definitely appreciate it. Uh, so maybe we can start with... Uh, the, one of the main things I'm interested to learn more about is what drove your passion, your anger when you were a a pretty enthusiastic Trump supporter. What was top of mind in that regard, if you could delve into some of the things that, that stood out as far as like what drove your passion there? Sure. Uh, thank you for that. And the first part of that answer for me goes all the way back to the year 2000. I was 23 years old. I was living in New York and I was a big Ralph Nader supporter. And it's not so much that I concurred with a lot of his policies or his ideology. I did some of them, but we're re the reason I really gravitated toward his campaign is that I figured out both parties didn't like him. And at that time, I was, a, I would say, a burgeoning political person more more or less getting into trying to understand national issues. But I was, you know, I was 23 years old and I'm not going to take the, oh, you know, I didn't know anything at 23. No, I was pretty, I, I was pretty political starting up at that point. So supporting Nader really came from disliking the two party system. And he, he was disliked by both. Looking back on it, I know that being in New York, my my vote didn't really affect the outcome whatsoever because of the Electoral College, which I've got some strong feelings in Electoral College if we get to them. But that was really my my initial foray into presidential national politics, voting for Ralph Nader. Now, now, 15 fast forward 15 years later. And of course, everyone knew by name Trump. And when he announced his presidency and had his presidential announcement speech. I wasn't this guy who said, you know, a lot of these people now say, oh, I was supportive of him when he came down the escalator. I, I think for the most part, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but I, that, was, that did not apply to me. But what I started to figure out pretty quickly is that both parties didn't like Trump either. And my, my overall dislike of the two-party system had only increased over time from 2000 to 2015. So once I figured out that both parties didn't like Trump, I relatively quickly said, I'm in. And, one, and once I was in, it was a relatively easy transition for me to really become a, a very avid supporter of Trump. I'm on public record having said that he'd win the primary, or I should say primary, that he'd be the nominee and that he would win the general election. Mm. And of course, for, for a lot of people, there were, the, there were the raising of eyebrows. I mean, Republicans and Democrats, I don't want to say quite writ large, but the majority of voters of both parties did not think that the election would go the way that it did. But I, I differed in that sense. And, and the reason I differed is because when I was talking with just your every day, I was out every day at the grocery store or the doctor's office. There were so many people, Zach, who said to me, well, maybe some of them a little bit under a whisper, but they said to me, yeah, I'm going to vote for Trump. I'm going to vote for him. And I just felt like something was happening at the grassroots that was going to result in Trump winning this election. And I, I just remember the, the, uh, the, it, was the, it was an ecstasy on election night not sleeping all night. I mean, my phone blew up probably more than any time ever that night with people asking me, how did you know? I can't believe this. 
you know, this was a this was a moment for us where if we were on if we were on board with Trump, it was a moment for us to feel validated, mm -hmm. to to feel like being called the names by Hillary Clinton, the the doubts by both parties, uh, having having national elected influential leaders, especially of the Republican Party, say Donald Trump is not qualified to be president. I mean, it it was a it was I don't, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to curse her, but it was a big blank you. You can definitely curse. Okay, it was a big <laughs> fuck you to the two party system and to that establishment. Mm -hmm. And so for me, having and, and and also for me personally, Zach, it did validate for me my dislike of the two party system because I felt like somebody came in and and basically took a sledgehammer to that system. Yes, I knew that Trump ran as a Republican, but we didn't really. A lot of Trump voters, myself included, we didn't really look at him as a Republican. Mm -hmm. We looked at him as somebody coming in to, to, to change this inside out system. And also, of course, d annihilating the Democrats that night and Hillary and Hillary and Hillary Clinton. Now, along the way, and I'm going to look at this from if we take that space between Trump announcing and Trump winning, I was around many others who uh, who influenced me. And I want to be very careful in how I word this because no one coerced me into voting for Trump. Nobody coaxed me into it. it I, I made my own decisions. I was I had my own thoughts, but I was I was very very influenced by several others who didn't just speak about Hillary Clinton and the Democrats as politically misguided. They spoke about Hillary Clinton and the Democratic Party as an existential threat to the country, and and I believe that. And so because I believe that, it only strengthened my support for Trump. And it, it not only that, it, it created this true good versus evil, do or die. If, if we lose the election, everyone who's not a Democrat is going to be irrelevant in their country for the rest of our lives. Th this isn't simply, it was not simply a we disagree on policy, we, we, we disagree on approach we disagree on style style and substance it was it, it was way beyond that it was way more existential than simply just saying we differ with hillary clinton and of course hillary clinton if someone was if someone was adamantly uh dis, if, if the two-party system was adamantly disfavored by someone such as myself it was very very easy to not want to vote for hillary clinton but i also want to emphasize on this point that my vote was not just a anti-Clinton vote. My vote was very much a pro-Trump vote. Mm -hmm. And I and I felt like with Trump as president, we were we were I was excited about politics. I felt like we we had some we had someone who came in and was willing to say that politicians have 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 ignored you, that we've seen jobs go overseas, we've seen communities hollowed out. And Zach, those are the good reasons that people had for voting for Trump. And I'm not trying to say that as some kind of self-defense. Something that the national press and the Democratic Party just refused to acknowledge is that people had legitimately good reasons for supporting Trump. People felt unheard. They felt unseen. They felt not listened to. They watched jobs outsourced. They watched communities hollow out. And Trump was, albeit not exactly in the most, uh, shall we say, articulate way, but he was addressing those issues head on. And so as, as part of our talk, I'd, I always like to, to set up two, what I see as two points that are very, very much either overlooked or swept under the rug by the national press and the Democratic Party, and even so many within the Republican Party, is that number one, there were very good reasons for supporting Trump. Even if someone didn't like the guy, and a lot of Trump, a lot of Trump and Republican voters didn't, but they liked what it was that he, he presented, what he stood for. And then the second, the second point I like to make as we get started here to give some context is that deep down, most MAGA Trump voters are in fact good people. They, they, are, they are not evil people. I do believe that they have been traumatized and exploited, which I know we're going to get into, but I do not believe deep down that they are these, these evil, racist, misogynistic people. Yes, of course, there's some within the MAGA world who are, who are that way, but I, don't believe, I, I really don't believe that about most MAGA voters. I mean, you and I were recently at the Brave, Brave Rangers convention, and a lot of the Reds we met, those who lean red, I know that most of them were and probably will vote for Trump. And 
I explain a lot of the red Zach this way is that if I were stranded on the side of the road and I had a flat tire and it was a torrential downpour, the Reds we met would, would get out of their cars, they would help change the flat tire in the rain, and then I would offer them money, they would refuse money, and they'd get back in the car and they'd wait for me to drive off safely. That's, that's, how, I look, that's how I really view them. So now there's the question of how, how do, why is it that those individuals feel so emotionally and spiritually and morally connected to Trump himself, because I have very strong feelings about MAGA having come out of that world. And I, I will admit that those feelings are not positive feelings. And I am looking forward to getting into with you here the reasons that I, that I left that world of MAGA. Mm -hmm. I want to delve a little bit more into when you talk about the, the, your dislike uh, of the two-party system and what were you seeing that there that really made you want to kind of blow up that system or, or have a big shakeup, you know, what, what was it specifically that, that you were seeing about the, you know, the, the Democrat and Republican uh, party leaders and such? I viewed them and I don't view it this way any longer, but I viewed them for many, many years, a decade plus as essentially two sides of the same coin. And because I viewed them that way, I, I will acknowledge and admit that part of the reason that I viewed them that way was because of ignorance. And ignorance is such an underappreciated, powerful tool. Just so many, so many directions it can take us in. But for me, it was, it was, an, it was essentially, I was very political, but I was also very, very ignorant. Um, I didn't really have much of an interest in policy. I looked at both parties as essentially the same in power for themselves. They, they benefited from, from their opposition, their us versus them, partisanship. Both of them were, would benefit from that. And I, and I felt like because of the parties being so wrapped up in reelection and fundraising and keeping up this us versus them, I, I, what I felt like is that they, they ignored most of the electorate. And, and, when, and when Trump came along, I felt like he identified that and he made a lot of people recognize it. And a, and a lot of people who were just generally pissed off at politics and politicians found someone whom they could align themselves with. And pol politics as a whole is a, is a, is a Rorschach test in which we, we project our own wants and needs and desires onto, onto politics and, and elected officials. Mm -hmm. and, and when you say, uh, you know, you mentioned jobs overseas and communities hollowed out and such, is it accurate to say that you were upset on behalf of the, the poor, the more poor and, and lower socioeconomic people in America? Is, is, was that a big part of what generated your passion, your, your disdain for the two parties is that they were not doing good by those people? I felt like broadly the two parties were more were often more concerned with what was happening in other nations than what was happening with Americans here at home, and and again Trump basically he very much tapped into that, and because he tapped into that, it it, it became relatively easy for me to come in and support him, and now Zach when I look back on it, and I know there's the old hindsight is 2020 and we'll get into reason the reasons I left. When I look back now, having come out of the, the fog of MAGA and having my own personal and political epiphany and road to Damascus moment, I'm going to pinpoint the moment when I should have run and not walked, but run. And it wasn't actually the announcement speech. It was the comment about John McCain, rest in peace. But because now, now it's, a, it's a fair question. Well, Rich, I, I don't understand. How, how could you have you knew that what he said was wrong. How could you have supported him? You knew when he said about banning Muslims from coming into the country that you know deep down that was wrong. And my answer is that's a fair point. But if you feel like the opposition is an existential threat to your life, your livelihoods, your family, you will support someone will support anyone or anything. And that's what made, and that's what made it easy to, to, to justify staying on board even if at times you, you've raised your eyebrows and thought, he said, you know, what did he say? He said, what? Because in any other context, we would have heard that and thought, mm, that's probably disqualifying. But in reality, it didn't disqualify Trump. It only strengthened his support. 
Well, I think you're, you're, you're getting at something that's hugely important, which is something I try to emphasize in my book, which I, which I think is one of the key factors in these things. It's like, when you feel that you are in an us versus them, good versus evil battle, the bad things that people do on your side just really don't matter that much. You know, and I think that, I think that's such a key thing to understand because I think what happens in, with these dynamics is Trump does something bad, somebody does something bad, and the other side thinks, look at what these people are okay with. They yeah. condone this behavior. But the reality is that when you feel, like you're saying, when you feel you're in this good versus evil existential threat mode, you don't really care about whatever, you know, these things, these, all these things seem minor in comparison to the war that you're fighting, that's right. right? That's right. And I'm going to pl- I'm going to plug here your article from last year when you offered up the, the us versus them feedback loop. Other side sees the other side is dangerous. The other side speaks speaks in in demeaning ways, calling them maybe existential threats, and then the other side ups that ante, and then the other side ups the ante even more, and then we just keep going in that circle. And and for me, it was I will say that the, the maybe maybe the truest statement that Trump ever said was I could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and not lose voters. I'm glad that I didn't have to make that decision, but I will tell you, short of having, short of having shot someone on Fifth Avenue, there's probably, there, there really is probably nothing he could have said that would have, that would have made me not support him. That's how strongly I felt about the, the, the failures of the two party system and the, 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 the threat that was posed by Clinton and the Democrats throughout the country. And maybe that's a good segue into, when you talk about feeling like Clinton and the Democrats were an existential threat, could you spell that out a little bit more? Like what were you, what was worst case scenario in your mind? What was going through your mind? Cause I think that's a really hard thing for a lot of liberals to, to understand, you know, what that fear looks like. Yes. And, and I just want to emphasize again, if I may reiterate this point that whenever I say something that sounds like a self-defense, I, I take accountability for my decisions. I, I I take full responsibility for them, and when when I think back to that time, and I I think about what or the reasons that I so adamantly opposed Hillary Clinton, just beyond a, a policy or 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 style or substance perspective, Zach, I have to say it was very very illogical how I concluded what I did, and maybe the illogicality is tied into this emotion about us versus them because us versus them is inherent in in our dna as a homo sapien species it it, it just it is us versus them and it's why i think that so many right-wing mythologies they very much are very easy to fall prey to because they capitalize on that so us versus them is very much in our in our nature and because it was, I was in that loop that you that you wrote about last year. When I look back on this, there there was no actual logical reason for me to feel the way that I did. It was purely driven by, I'm going to say it, a primitive emotion. I didn't think of it that way at the time, but that's how I, that's what I recognized it to be. And and I and I recognize that if we did not succeed in that election that the Democratic Party would never lose another presidential election ever again. That's what I thought. Hmm. That is what I actually believed. And I know that some are going to be listening and thinking, how in the hell did this guy think that? I mean, wh- what did you, what was it that made you think that? And I know it might be a, an unsatisfactory answer for so many, but the answer is it wasn't really logical. And maybe that aspect of it is, is in, in fairness to those who are left leaning, maybe that ex, that would I think at least partly explain some of the frustrations that they might have. But those who are left leaning simply just they 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 want to view Trump and Trump supporters essentially through the prism and the lens of social media. You've written extensive, right? You I think it's some of the best content you've produced regarding how social media feeds that hydra, that us for them rage and anger. If you can, uh, even if they were quite illogical, did you have fears of like, were the Democrats just going to, you know, when you say they weren't going to lose an election, did did you picture some like authoritarian kind of unfair rigging of elections or was it an influx of uh, immigrants or were, were there any particular 
fears in your kind of like nightmarish visions of, of what could happen? So when I was uh, when I was very much in the in the MAGA world at the time before the election, I projected my belief that Americans, for the most part, Americans were were ignored and not heard unless they were wealthy and affluent. And I should mention at that time, being a business owner, I was actually doing relatively well in, in, my, in my life at the time, which is a whole other point we'll get into about the stereotype of Trump voters as uneducated and uncouth. I was actually doing very well in my life, Zach, overall. I mean, I wasn't a gazillionaire, but I was doing okay and I wasn't want for, for my needs. And looking back on it, I'm, I ask myself now, what exactly was I afraid of, right? Like, what was I, what was I so worried about? I didn't consciously think at the time, oh, we're going to bring in all of these, all of these, uh, these immigrants, and then they're going to, they're going to, and I don't mean it in a replacement theory, his parrot, that conspiracy theory, but they were going to bring in all new people, and they were going to, of course, vote Democrat, and then, of course, they were going to, they, they were going to continue to ignore us, and I, and I felt so angry that I was going to keep being ignored. And I thought Trump is not a guy who's going to ignore me. He's not going to ignore us. He is there to, to, be the, to be the general. And all of these thoughts that I had, Zach, they just became magnified to the nth degree once he was elected. Because whatever, whatever feelings of anger and rage that I might have had in the lead up to the election, it's not an exaggeration to say that they increased a hundredfold during his presidency. Mm -hmm. And some of my right-wing writings are out there in the public realm. And I won't say that I don't stand by any of it, but for the most part, I, I was actually reading some of them in anticipation of having this conversation with you. And I have to say, I don't recognize that guy. I don't recognize him. Some of what I said, the dehumanization, reading that work, the rage jumps off the page to the reader. But of course, many of those reading it felt exactly the way I did. So I had once again that validation that I'm on the right track because I looked at I, I looked at my time as a as a MAGA Trump supporter, and I've never served in the military. I have the utmost respect for servicemen and women. I never have, but I viewed myself as a patriotic soldier fighting a good versus evil battle against the enemy within, with Trump as the general. Well, you know, I'm, I'm starting to get a better picture of it because what you're saying about feeling on the precipice of like Democrats consolidating the power and in your view of, of this, that meant that this out of touch elite would never have to answer to the people and the the problems you saw. And it was just a, a huge outrage from your point of view, yeah, you know, it's that's that's making that's making some sense to me. Yeah. And, and and Zach, on that point, when I would encourage and advocate advocate for for others supporting Trump, I spoke to a lot of of my own friends and acquaintances who are not political at all, and I would go to them and say, to that point you mentioned, I would ask them something I mentioned earlier. I would ask them, how would you feel waking up the day after election day, knowing that you are irrelevant? That is, I mean, my, my word, and I have to preface by saying I am not trained or educated whatsoever in therapy or psychology or, psych, or psychiatry or counseling or any of that. But for me, it was, it was traumatic. The idea of losing that election was a, was a constant adrenaline rush of trauma for me. Why did you feel that way, Rich? Not a lot of logic behind it. Well, uh, I have seen the argument that, and I can't remember who, I think it's multiple people have said this. I can't remember the most recent one I saw, but the argument has been made that so much of our divides come down to distrust of government. You know, that this fear that the government is, has the worst, the, the worst intentions and the, and the worst motivations, you know, and so much of the, you know, I, I think that's more the case. People have made that case about Republicans, but I do see some of that anti-establishment feeling is also, you know, on the left historically and, and even now, I think there's just a lot of distrust of people in power. Do you feel that that's accurate, like a summary of, you know, what drives a lot of this is just feeling like there's these powerful people in control that don't really care about the common person and such? This anti-government sentiment then and now, it permeated itself 
all throughout the MAGA world. Because something that the MAGA world provided for, and it still does, is a community. And in that community, it was our safe space. I know the political right doesn't like to use that term, but it actually was. That's what it was. It was a safe space for us to get together and talk about how the government was trying to oppress us. And when they went after Trump, they were really going after us. And we, of course, again, back to the loop, because we felt like they were going after us, we had to go after them double. And it's what it's what confirmed and affirmed for me this feeling of being being a soldier being a patriotic soldier in this in this 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 war that uh, against against those who would otherwise want to render us irrelevant and so that idea of the of anti government very much is a part of the maga ethos now now i'm not saying that that means that most of the people i were around would there were some people I knew, not great friends, but some people I knew who were at the January 6th protests. And to my knowledge, none of them stormed the Capitol. They were there for just support and listen to the speech. I, I wasn't there, which, I, you know, when we get into some of the reasons I left, I was not there. But for, for me, there, and then once, once, once we fully ingratiated ourselves into the MAGA world, we did we did feel like there was this democrat rhino republican in name only uh globalist which globalist that that um that term is is an is an anti jewry term which of course anti jewry is jewry is the longest running conspiracy theory in the world a quick note here regarding the term globalist in a previous episode i talked to james kerchick who is jewish about anti-semitism in america and we dug into some of the nuance about that word and how it can be used in more reasonable and non-anti-Semitic ways and also about some of the more anti-Semitic uses. Okay, back to the talk. So we felt like there was an actual coordinated conspiracy against Trump and, and via V against we. So because we felt that way, we felt justified in pretty much any way that we thought mm -hmm. that it was that, that if, it's, if it's war, war is hell, and there are really no rules in war. And that was not, and that was a mindset of, of those I was around all the time, Zach. I mean, I broke bread, I was in groups, I was in clubs, I was sponsors of clubs, I would message every single day with those in the MAGA world, and it was always, we're on the right side of history. We're on the correct side fighting these these evil enemies who would otherwise want to take over America for their own good. In my book, Diffusing American Anger, I have a section on conspiracy theories because I feel beliefs in big plots can play a big role in polarization dynamics. There can be a self-reinforcing aspect. The more us versus them animosity and fear one has, the more one is prone to seeing big malicious plots by the other side. And part of this is due to the outgroup homogeneity effect, where we perceive the other side as all being alike. Because we perceive this big, scary, monolithic group, we start perceiving all sorts of ways the people in that group are working together and conspiring. We'll find more and more evidence that supports our fearful and angry views of the other side and their big plots. And the more big plots we perceive, the more that will increase our us versus them feelings. And there's plenty of this kind of thing on the right and left, even if you probably think one side is worse in this regard. I recently put up that excerpt from my book about conspiracies on the website for my book. You can find that at American-Anger.com. I think a big part of reducing polarization entails trying to make people see just how unlikely and rare large secret plots are. And that's what I try to do with that chapter in my book. Okay, back to the talk. A lot of people listening... Uh, more liberal people would be wondering something like with the accusations of uh, Trump being racist at the time or, or bigoted, what would your response, your view of those things have been back then when, when someone would say accuse you of that or accuse Trump of that kind of stuff? I didn't really feel that way. Even if I might have raised my eyebrows and said, oh, he said, what, did, what exactly did he say? I, I didn't actually feel that way, and I was actually very defensive of Trump. And one of the specific reasons I was is that if we recall back to the 2016 campaign, Trump went into a lot of Democrat majority cities. He went into, as I recall, Detroit. I recall he went into Milwaukee. Uh, he didn't go into Philly, but he went he went nearby. 
And if you look at those cities, he won all of those states in 2016. And so I looked at it and thought, well, if they're saying he's, if the Democrats are saying he's racist, he must be exactly the opposite. Even if he would say, make a statement and I would think, oh, I'm just going to cover my ears on that one. I didn't, I, to me, I was, def- was going to defend him essentially no matter what. That's what I would tell a Democrat. Who would, because that, that point, Zach, that you mentioned, when I wrote, I, so I, I've, I've penned and published three different mea culpas, and the most recent one was Newsweek. And the, the comments that I received with, for the most part, I would say supportive, and I appreciate that. But some of the comments I received that I would that I would consider amongst the most polarizing were actually from, I presume, Democrats, but definitely anti-Trump voters. And the comments ranged from, you're, you're a Nazi in sheep's clothing. The comments ranged from, just shut up and go away. We don't want to hear from people like you anymore. You voted twice for this guy. You're the problem. You should apologize to me. And why should we? Why should we listen to you? I've also had some other comments that I'm a that I'm a paid Democrat mole, to which I respond. I'm still waiting for my my paycheck from that. I haven't received any money yet. Still waiting. And those are the types of comments I receive from both left and the right. And that point that you mention all the time about depolarization, there is a certain. I'm going to use this phrase. There's a quiet rage in those comments because something. That, that has happened in America as a result of MAGA is that MAGA has, has made America forget that we are a forgiving nation. Before we get too far into your um, mind changing, I wanted to go back to the, the racism part because I think uh, I actually spent a good amount of my time in my book making the case for no matter what you think of Trump, you know, say you think he's a horrible racist or whatever. I think it's very important to separate that view, the, the, the view we have of Trump from the people who support him, because, you know, that there's just all these cases of very exaggerated and taken out of context things about Trump in the liberal leaning media about, you know, his racist statements and such. And if you can start to see that aspect, you can start to understand why people are skeptical of all those things. And you can also see how people it's possible to take the worst case interpretations of some of this stuff. For example, to give a specific example, the thing that many people will, will come to, will come to mind for this thing is him saying, you know, Mexicans are, they're, they're, they're bringing rapists. They're not bringing the best people, which many people interpret that as, as a racist thing against Mexicans. But then you can find Mexican American Trump supporters who said that he clearly wasn't talking about all Mexicans. He was talking about criminals, you know? Right. So just to say there are these, Worst case interpretations, best case interpretations, and that helps us understand for for many of these cases. And I and I go through many of these examples in my book. I think it's very important to examine that because I think a lot of liberals are just on board the worst case interpretation of everything he said. But if you're pro Trump, if you've you know if you're interpreting everything he says through the best lens, that those things look very very different. So I think that's a very important point of understanding you know how we get on the these these different sides of, you know, the, these chasms of, of divides and such. The, the way that so many of us interpreted to go to that specific example about other nations not sending their best people. I remember how I felt about how I construed that statement, because again, Rorschach test here, hearing essentially something that affirms our, our view, our, our fears, our concerns. At the time, it's, it's not that I said, yes, he's right. All Mexicans coming over are rapists. They're not sending their best. But what I did think at the time was it was, it was highlighting and, and homing in on a point of feeling like if we weren't specifically a Democrat, we were going to bring other people into the country, and then eventually they were going to outnumber us, and then Democrats would just control America forever. A quick note here. In my book, I talk about the fear that Republicans have regarding some Democrat leaders being pro-immigration in order to win elections. There are some very pessimistic framings of that fear by people on the left. For example, this fear is sometimes framed as an extremely racist, white supremacist fear. Sometimes you'll hear it called the Great Replacement Theory. That's a belief that some far-right people have where they think there's a literal plot to replace white people with racial minorities and literally eliminate white people entirely. 
But in my book, I attempt to show how there can be quite mundane versions of these kinds of fears. And one way to see this, if you're liberal, is to imagine that immigrants were more likely to vote Republican than to vote Democrat. And to imagine that Republicans were, in that world, a pro-immigration party, and would say things like, immigrants have great traditional values and are making America more strong. If we lived in that world, it'd be easy to understand how some Democrats would likely think that Republicans were only pro-immigration because it helped them win elections. In other words, when there is an issue that can directly affect which party wins elections. It's no surprise that there will be a lot of anger and pessimism and distrust around that topic. I talk about that more in my book, but I do think it's important to realize that there are some fairly banal aspects of how fears of losing elections can make people distrustful and extremely pessimistic about the other side's motivations. In other words, these views can be on a spectrum from very unreasonable to more understandable. And Rich will talk later in this episode about some of these things. Okay, back to the talk. That's, now, if you think about the, the, the that's a big leap. I, I think that's a big leap right there to go from, well, what did he say? He wasn't, what he meant was, it, don't take it literal. I, I looked at it more from the perspective of, yeah, you know, I think that that's, a, and, and I didn't, and I just want to clarify, Zach, I didn't think that it necessarily at the exact time that he said it at that announcement speech in 2015, but as I became more and more influenced by others who were, who were saying to me consistently that, yeah, to some aspect, to some extent, he, he's, he's right in that the Democratic Party just wants to bring all these people in from other nations and then just outnumber us, take our guns, um, indoctrinate our children in public education. It, it, it was this, it was this never ending snowball of what the Democrats were going to do. And every week that would go by, I had another reason to support Trump and oppose Clinton and the Democrats. It was like a it was like a weekly occurrence. It was oh, what, we, what what's this week about? Oh, this week's about the guns. Next week it's about it's about education. The next week it's about taking over and 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 winning elections forever. And and so just having a never ending stream of politically traumatic mythologies that I exposed myself to, and then once he won, it just propelled me into a traumatic stratosphere. One that. When I look back on it now, even to this day, it, it shocks me some of what I thought and said. Well, right. Like you say, it's like when you are in that frame of good versus evil, when you start going down that rabbit hole, everything is just going to start being filtered through that that lens. You know, everything's going to be a trigger point of like, that's another piece of evidence for what they're doing to us. Right. And everything just builds into that hurricane of, of us versus them points of view. Yeah. Uh, I, w- I wanted to touch on something real quick before we get to your, uh, you know, your change of mind. Uh, you had mentioned how your rage got magnified once Trump was elected. And that's something I talk about in my book, too, which I think is underexamined. It's like, no matter what you think of how Trump got his start, like, say, you have the most pessimistic view of like his early supporters and how he won the primary and such. I think there's this thing that happens that, you know, once he does become the Republican candidate, Many people just voted for him because he was the Republican candidate, right? Yes. And uh, there, there's a there's a chain reaction that happens. You know, you can look at the the voting patterns. The fact that you know it was largely it, it was interesting, largely for being much the same as previous elections. Like we were, many Republicans were just like, "Well, he's the Republican candidate, and I'm, I'm not voting for Hillary Clinton." You know, she's like the the worst Democrat I would I, I would vote for. So I'm I'm just going to vote for Trump. And I think. Once he gets elected and you have all this liberal reactions, the the very pessimistic views of Trump, the the coverage of him, you know, which I think he deserves in, in, in a lot of ways. But once you have that outpouring of of uh, coverage and also just the the insults from other citizens about, you know, writing op eds about how if you're a Trump supporter, you're, you know, morally negligent and all these things, you're 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 a monster, you're whatever. Uh, it just kicks off this rage cycle, and then all these people, in- including yourself, are feeling even more rage because now you thought you did a great thing, and now, or even just an average thing for some Republicans, it's like I'm just voting for the Republican candidate like I did before, and and now I'm being attacked for all of these things, and so you're just kicking off this rage cycle even more. Uh, so, can you talk a little bit about sure. that? Is does that all sound like? kind of how you would view things there uh, a couple points okay a po- couple points on that and that's i think a very astute observation and i would i would first part of that i would say that i, I consider myself i, I mean I, I read and read and read i would consider myself a, a, a 
politico, a political junkie, but now I'd like to think I look at politics less ignorantly, a little more objectively. Most of the electorate is not political. And this is something the national press, I think, often fails to understand. Because there's this world of looking at Twitter, what goes on in social media. And mm -hmm. when we look at when we look at candidates, candidates are chosen by primary voters. Once the primaries are over, the general electorate, who probably in the case of Trump, they, the general elect, those who were apolitical Republican voters, yeah, they, they, knew of, they knew of some of what Trump said, but maybe they don't really read the news. They're not reading the Atlantic or the New York Times. Mm -hmm. Maybe occasionally they'll watch Fox, but they're probably thinking, yeah, you know, all right, you know, Trump's not always the, the most articulate guy, but I think it's being blown out of proportion. So, well, you know, yeah, I don't I know he shouldn't have said that once in a while. I don't like this, but he's a Republican nominee. He, he, he won resoundingly in, uh, against in all the primaries, uh, most, most of the primaries against all these these uh, well-known established Republicans. Yeah, I'm going to cast a vote for Trump. How, how harmful could he really be? And, and most importantly, very importantly, the, the view that Democrats are, you know, corrupt and, and such just as much as Republicans and such. So. The justification there too. It's like, hey, they they suck too, no matter what Trump does. That's right, and and that's and that is in, I think is also inherent in apoliticism because I argue mm -hmm. that they, I I would argue that apoliticism is a bubble unto itself. There is a bubble aspect to apoliticism, and and, and so because because of that reason, I think there are general what I'm going to call general election Republicans right now in the country. And these are these are mostly apolitical, maybe slightly political. Maybe they pay attention a couple weeks or a couple months before an election. For a good deal of those Republicans, not sure how many, but probably a, if it's a minority, it's probably a relatively good sized minority. They, they probably have a, a meh feeling about about Trump as a candidate, because I believe he'll be the nominee. And that would be a whole other episode about what what the possibilities are. I mean, there's a possibility that Trump could be the nominee and imprisoned or in house arrest, right, depending on how these trials go. But I think for some of those voters who are kind of, eh, you know, eh, or, eh, I'm not sure if I'll vote for him again. But when it comes time to vote, even those, and this is a slight contradiction here, I think, even some of those apolitical voters, like you point out, they've just been, they've been partisan voters. Oh, my dad voted for Reagan. You know, my granddad voted for Eisenhower. Yeah, I voted for Bush. I voted for Romney. I just tend to vote for the Republican. I think they're the lesser of two evils. Mm -hmm. And I and I and it's funny because for me, I'm well, maybe not funny when I look back on it, but I look at it like, well, no, there was. I actually had a little website once that I call lesser of one evil because I would say, no, 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 there's not a lesser of two. And I voted third party for many elections, not just presidential. I voted for libertarian candidates. I would. I voted for Ralph Nader actually several times. So I looked at it as no, no, no. It's not a lesser of two evils. It's basically a lesser of one evil. They're essentially the same. And so the apolitical voters right now, they, there, there is a there is a cooling with Trump. Now the primary voters, the ones who choose the the candidate, uh, they 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 are probably more fervently rabid in their support of Trump now than at any time. A quick note here: you may be thinking, well, how could people be non-committal or not really feel strongly about Trump? They must know all the horrible things Trump has done, right? His horrible, insulting things he says, his election denial, his attempting to overturn the election. But I think we make a big mistake when we think that other people have the same views of things that we do. As Rich mentioned earlier, for a lot of Republicans who distrust liberals and distrust liberal-leading media, there can be a sense of, if they're saying that about Trump, it's probably a lie, or at least it's probably greatly exaggerated. And it's important to realize that there are some legitimate reasons people don't trust liberal leading media. If you're curious about this, I'd recommend checking out a piece by Glenn Greenwald that he wrote for The Intercept titled Beyond BuzzFeed, The 10 Worst, Most Embarrassing U.S. Media Failures on the Trump-Russia Story. It goes into some very bad and irresponsible reporting on the Trump-Russia connection. Stories that just seem quite bad and biased. That's just one area, but if you can start to see why it is that people are distrustful of the media, you can start to see how, for a lot of Republicans, it's very easy to assume that the mainstream framings about Trump are just lies or biased or politically motivated, all these things. This can help explain reactions you hear like, so what if Trump called the election rigged, Democrats did that too, 
or other reactions that don't see Trump's behavior as that strange or unusual. I think it's important to realize how these chasms in our worldviews form and grow. I think it's important to see the understandable and human reasons for these chasms and not to assume things like, Trump voters must see how horrible Trump is in the same way I see how horrible he is, and they fully support all these horrible things. It's just not that simple for many citizens. Okay, back to the talk. I think about that a lot, the more apolitical people, which I know some of those people, basically Republicans, and and I think it's an important point to understand that that is a, you know, they're kind of people that are just like, hey, they all suck. I am voting for the lesser of two evils. And it kind of makes sense in the sense that if you distrust a lot of government and politicians, which a lot of people do, choosing the the party that wants less, you know, smaller government makes sense in that regard. You know, it's just a general distrust of these, of politicians and government and such. And I, and I, I think that's an important distinction because like you say, it's like a lot of people speak about Trump, you know, anybody that votes for Trump as if they're this enthusiastic, very much on board with everything. And I, I just don't see that nuance being discussed much in, in uh, pundits work and such. It, and it's not, it's not because they, just either the national press either just doesn't realize it because of the work they do, the people they speak to, that it, that the the vast majority of the electorate, Democrat and Republican, they're apolitical. I would say that the concentration of apolitical is probably higher on the GOP side, but if it is, it's not much more, Zach. Maybe we can uh, segue into talking about how you changed your mind there. What What was kind of the breaking point for you? Did it happen slowly or did it happen all at once? What was your, what was your breaking point? I just want to make two comments, uh, just preface how I, before I'll get into that with even being pretty deep in the MAGA world, I I wasn't a person who had a Trump flag or had a bumper sticker or had a tattoo of Trump on my ass somewhere. Like I wasn't that kind of a MAGA voter, but I, I was a person I would consider an activist. I sent money to the Trump campaign. I volunteered and made phone calls. I even wrote part of the call script for the Trump campaign. So anyone who made a call on behalf of the Trump campaign or received a call on behalf of the campaign heard part of the, some of the text they heard, I wrote that. And I did it pro bono. I did not ask for money, nor was I offered it. From, from the perspective of putting a flag on a boat and having a boat parade with Trump, I wasn't doing that. But I, I considered myself very much more in the, in the actual mix of activism. And so when 2020 came around and the pandemic started, my view at the time of the pandemic was I knew it was I didn't think it was a it was a, an Anthony Fauci conspiracy. I wouldn't say that I was very, very deep into the rabbit hole that it's being used by the Democrats to tyrannically oppress us. But I did, I did look at it from the perspective of that the Democrats were exaggerating its effects, even though I knew that people, yes, were dying. But I, 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 I looked at the Democrats and the way I thought of it was that they were taking some statistical and data liberties to show just how deadly the virus was. So even in the lead up to 2020, I was still of the belief that we had to defeat Biden the same way we needed to defeat Clinton. And I knew during the course of the pandemic that Trump wasn't always handling it well. I knew that. In fact, I remember watching the daily press conferences and eventually I turned the TV off to not watch them anymore because I said, you know, what? I don't want to watch these anymore. I can't stand the banner back and forth between he and the press. I've already made up my mind anyway. And I'm, all, and I'm all in. And then came election day and I was out there making calls, talking to people. Hey, can I, do you need a ride to the polls? Do you need a ride to this location? I was, I was all in. And then, and then we lost. I did not believe that the election was stolen. I didn't think that. As a matter of fact, in the lead up to the election, Zach, I felt like, yes, I thought Trump would win, but I, would, I, was, I was preparing myself to not be shocked if Biden won. And the reason I thought that is because I knew how much just sheer white hot hate existed for Trump. And I thought and I thought that if we were going to lose, it was going to be because the Democrats were so motivated by hate. Some of those those rhinos who sided with the op- who sided with the traitorous Democrats that they were going to come out and in their in their white hot 
disdain of Trump, they were going to go ahead and support Biden. That's why I, that's what I felt going into it. So when Trump lost, I didn't think it was a stolen election because I looked at it as, well, he lost because of all the hatred toward him. That's how I really looked at it at the time. I didn't, I didn't think that there were, that there were Italian servers and, and bags brought in in the middle of the night in, in Atlanta and, you know, the night that uh, the night of election night, it was three, four o'clock in the morning. Trump comes out, gives his press conference saying this is a, it's a fraud upon the American people. And, and I, I wasn't quite in that way of thinking about it, but I, I still believe that there was a chance that we could win. I, I was still holding out hope. A small note here. I have a couple of previous episodes that dig into the nuance around people's election distrust. I have one talk, a talk with political researcher Thomas Popinski on the topic, how many Trump voters actually believe the election was stolen. I have another episode where I talk to Peter Wood, a conservative who believed the 2020 election was stolen, and dig into some of the reasons he believes that. I also talk about election distrust in my book, Diffusing American Anger, and make the case to both liberals and conservatives for why a lot of the election distrust on both sides recently is illogical and bad for the country. Okay, back to the talk. And as time went on throughout the course of 2020, I, it did it did more and more dawn on me that it, I, I came to accept that that we'd lost. So I was still I was still in MAGA up until the summer of 2021. And actually, the re, the, the catalyst for my leaving MAGA was actually not Trump. It was Ron DeSantis, my governor. I've lived in Florida for many years. I voted for Ron DeSantis in 2018, both in the primary and in the general election. So of course I was ecstatic when he won and I was ecstatic that Trump had endorsed him because I felt like, okay, Ron DeSantis is one of us, he's on our side, he's gonna, he, he's, he's, another, he's another warrior in the army. And I thought in fairness to DeSantis, I thought that he actually handled the pandemic relatively well in 2020, based on the, based on the data we had, data was changing pretty rapidly, sometimes by the day. I felt like he actually handled it pretty well overall. Found. Yeah, we could look back and say, well, you should have done this more, should have done that more. I think at the time he, he, he sought to find an, an equilibrium that could, that could balance keeping the state open, but certain segments try to protect the most vulnerable. And that's why when the COVID vaccine came out, he was adamantly in support of it. He even created a distribution model across the state so that way senior citizens could be the first recipients of the COVID vaccine. You might remember, listeners might remember that there's a, I, I mean, I consider it a famous photo. I'm not sure how many people would remember it, but there's this famous photo of Ron DeSantis pushing a, a senior citizen lady in a wheelchair to get her vaccine. And I remember thinking, you know, that, 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 see, that's what, a, that's leadership. Like that's what a leader does. That's someone who's out there saying, okay, I'm going to protect the most vulnerable. And he was saying, get the vaccine. Your chances of getting sick, your chances of dying are, are, are lessened if you go ahead and get the vaccine. I was so happy about that. And that was in 2020. Now, fast forward to summer 21, COVID went into its Delta phase. Now, I have two small kids, Zach. At the time, they were five and two. So I wasn't overly concerned about my kids getting sick. But when Delta came, there were more and more reports locally and statewide in Florida, and of course some other states as well, but I was paying most attention to Florida, where children, they were falling ill with this virus. And in, and in some cases, yes, it was rare, thankfully, but in some cases, I remember reading the stories about children dying from COVID. And I remember thinking at the time, wow, you know, DeSantis has been so, he's been such a, a, a virulent supporter of this vaccine. He's gonna, he's gonna divorce himself from the anti-vaccine hysteria. He's going to sever ties with them. That's what I really, I really thought that, Zach. And then it seemed overnight he changed. Hmm. And it wasn't that he just came out with a position of get the vaccine, but I'm against mandates. Even though I don't agree with that position, it, it, there is some logical, it is a defensible position one might take. I don't agree with it because vaccine mandates actually have a very long history in the United States, including George Washington, who made his troops during the Amer American Revolution. He, he deliberately had his troops infect themselves with smallpox. George Washington was the first vaccine advocate, but that was just a sidebar. Sorry. So I thought, uh, so Ron DeSantis, all of a sudden he changed, it seemingly changed overnight. And it wasn't that he just said, get the vaccine, I'm against mandates. He came out and, and, and then became a fierce opponent of the vaccine, which then continued to, to devolve into this vaccine is, gonna, is, is, is actually not doing anything to help people. It might even be harming people. 
And Zach, I have to tell you that when that happened, it jolted and jarred me in a way that I don't believe I've ever felt before in a political context or otherwise. And I just thought, man, ki kids, and, and I'm not, and let me just say, I'm not suggesting that senior citizens dying was any less sad or tragic. I just want to be clear on that. Okay. I'm not making this about age who died, but when children are getting sick, we, we in the public that, that tends to, to resonate a little bit differently, especially if we have kids, but it also meant that the virus was getting deadlier. I, I remember distinctly a moment at night and I just thought that I, I just remember thinking, how could he do this? How could he actually say what he said with children dying? And that's where it started for me, Zach. That's where all of a sudden I started to doubt my support. But it didn't end there because around that time, Trump, of course, was continuing with this traumatic rhetoric of the stolen election. I, I continued to not believe that it was a stolen election. I was, I was growing fatigued with him saying it. I was tired of hearing about it. I said, we lost. Let's get ready for the next election. But then I decided to do something else. I decided to think, you know, what led to these individuals to actually storm the Capitol? Because for a long time after Jan, well, I, I should say in the first five or so months, even in the first six months or so after the insurrection, here was my attitude about it. Yeah, it wasn't good, but it's being blown in, it's blown, it's being blown out of proportion. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a bigger deal than it really was. Most people there were peaceful. They, they had a couple of assholes who decided to storm in, carry a Confederate flag and go into Nancy Pelosi's office. No, I don't support it. But it's, it, it, it's not a big deal that's being made, to, made into by the press and the Democratic Party. But then I, just, then I decided to jump into a rabbit hole. And by jumping in that rabbit hole, I started to read what I consider to be credible sources. Even though the national press, I, I have my issues with them, I consider them generally credible sources. I started to get into who are these groups? Who, is, who, who exactly is QAnon? Who exactly is the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, the Three Percenters? I had known about these groups in the election, but I thought, yeah, it's a couple of, it's a couple of dopes here and there. It's basically a hobby for them. Mm -hmm. But then as I more and more read about what was the, the, the foundations of their actions and their rhetoric, the white supremacy, the anti-Jewry, the anti-gay. What I, what I began to recognize is I began to recognize individuals, even though I may not have thought exactly the way that they did, I saw in them the trauma that I was starting to come out of. I recognized it. And as I, and as I recognized it, I did something that again is very unnatural. I started to ask myself, with just my thoughts and I alone at night, is it possible that my support was misguided? Is it possible that I, that I was wrong? That I was wrong to support all of this? So much so to the point that it, 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 it was like there was this war going on in my mind and in my, and in my soul, emotionally, spiritually, even though I'm not the most religious person, morally, I sat there and I asked myself, what if I'm wrong? What if all of this support is not really who I am? Looking at DeSantis, looking at the stolen election, looking at all of these conspiracies, the forces that led to it. I understand most of the people, Zach, who were there at the insurrection. I know that most of them, most of them were there peacefully. But when I hear the pushback from others about, well, it was only a small percentage who went there and committed the violence and, 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 and broke into the Capitol, my response to that is it doesn't take many people to create chaos. I would, I would look at it the same way with the George Floyd protests. Okay, those who rioted and looted and set ablaze businesses, those people who, were, who, who have been caught by the DOJ, and there's over a thousand of them by my count, they have been tried. Those individuals should be prosecuted. They should be. And I know that's a point that you had mentioned before, and we discussed that. They should, so, so again, vast majority were peaceful, exercising their constitutional right to peaceful freedom of assembly. But it only took a small number to create some of that chaos. And I'm not trying to compare the crimes of setting a fire businesses and, and, and an insurrection, but it only took a small percentage of those at the Capitol. And, and, and here's, here's a point that I want to say that I'm trying to avoid hyperbolization, but I'm going to say it because Mike Pence was, Vice President Pence was 40 feet away from some of those who rioted. And I've been saying that we were 40 feet away 
from the American experiment, which was is, it was and is nearly a quarter of a millennium old, he was 40 feet away from that experiment possibly ending. Because the 12th Amendment requires the president of the Senate, the vice president, to count the electoral votes. All of this bullshit about send votes back. Mike Pence is there to count votes. He's a math, he's, an, he's the highest paid arithmetic teacher in the world at that day. That's what he is. He's there to count votes, say X state, Y state, and that's all he's there. But once they came in, that small percentage, I believe that they would have either rendered him in, um, incapacitated or he would have been murdered. And we have no constitutional means by which to figure out what to do next. It is very, very possible, and I'm saying this not to exaggerate, that the American experiment might have ended that day. When I look back on it, as I started to, as I started to doubt my support, ask myself these questions, which just for a while, Zach, I was at a phase in my life where all of that happened to me. There was a fear. And I don't mean it in, a, in an abstract way. There was this fear of having to acknowledge, was I wrong? And I came to the conclusion that I was. No matter how I looked at it, no matter what, I, I could have found myriad justifications for why I wasn't wrong. I could no longer doubt and I could no longer question that I was mistaken in the reasons I supported Trump, DeSantis, and MAGA. And, and, there, and there are two lines of demarcation I came to. Now, again, I want to preface by saying, I do not think what I'm about to say applies to most Republicans. But if we look at the Republican Party platform, there are two policy platform positions that they have taken. The first is, I believe that the Republican Party has deemed acceptable, avoidable deaths and suffering. That's what I believe. Now, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that most of the people who vote that way are, but I do believe that the Republican Party has established that as a platform. The way they talked about COVID, the way that it's spoken about today about firearms. That might be, admittedly, a polarizing statement to say that. That's how I came to view that part, that line of demarcation. There was another line of demarcation that I came to, which was the defense and justification of politically motivated violence. The Republican Party was very clever in saying that January 6th was legitimate political discourse because the majority of people who were there were peaceful. And they were. And that's factually correct. Now, to your point about the feedback loop, polarization, Whenever the Republican Party leaders were asked about January 6th, the result was always, the answer was always, what about the riots of 2020? So one side did it. It was bad. But yeah, our side might have done it too. But what about the other side? So I came to two lines of demarcation. What I, what I consider to be an acceptance of avoidable deaths and suffering and then defense of politically motivated violence because those who stormed the Capitol were motivated by politics. They, they thought the election was stolen. A quick note here. I have a previous episode where I interview political researcher Thomas Zaitsoff on the topic, how many Americans actually support political violence? And then recently there was some interesting research by Sean Westwood examining how support for political violence is likely much lower than has widely been reported due to some mistakes in surveys and survey interpretations that Sean examines. Okay, back to the talk. And when I came to those two lines of demarcation, I, I could not cross them. And I, and I want to offer a, a what if here, because I think it's a valid what if as part of this discussion. If Trump had won in 2020, I can't prove it, but I believe that I would have, I would have gotten so deep in the rabbit hole, I would, not have, I would not have been able to come out of it. I don't, I don't believe I would have been able to. Because there's that, that term we, we sometimes hear. I, I don't hear it a lot, but you and I have mentioned it sunk cost fallacy. Once we get so deep into something, whether it's politics or otherwise, once we get so deep into something, we can't really reverse course at that point. You're all in. We're simply too far in. If, if I had gotten further into the rabbit hole, I think it's almost certain, as close to 100% certainty as I could give statistically without maybe it being quite 100%, I don't think I would have, I don't think I would have gotten out. I don't know what that would have looked like for me. I mean, I was already, looking back on it, I was already very highly politically traumatized. I had become exactly what I was purportingly fighting about or fighting against. I was fighting tyranny 
I was up against this enemy. I became what I was up against. And and there's a personal note that I like to mention. I don't think my wife would would mind. Uh, she's not here now, so she can't give me the evil Wi-Fi. My wife had told me probably a year or so ago, which keep in mind that I would say by probably the first several months of 2022, I consider my, there's not an exact moment I pinpoint to because it, epiphanies tend to be these, these unconscious moments that occur. And then all of a sudden there's this one moment. So we're not really conscious of all of what leads up to an epiphany, but when it occurs, we know, and to paraphrase Hemingway, my epiphany occurred gradually and then suddenly all at once. I would say for me, it was really that probably three to six month mark in 2022. And my wife made a comment to me when she realized that I had, I had come out of that world. There was a liberation, a fog lifted. And she said, I actually wanted to vote for Hillary, but I didn't because I wanted to support you, meaning me. I have to tell you that that was a moment that it was it was really really hard for me to hear that not not because i was upset with her it just it reinforced for me i was the person that i was fight that i thought i was fighting against on the other side i enacted a dictatorship in my own household it, it, tyranny maybe not dictatorship in a literal sense but i basically coerced my wife into voting a certain way to support me. And God bless my wife because I'm married 15 years. I always say I'm married up. She was very, very supportive of me when I was when I was penning all my right wing articles and going on radio interviews and going to Trump clubs and speaking at Trump clubs. She supported me the entire time. And when she told me that, it hit me so hard that I gave that was the moment where every single day, Zach, I give thanks that I came out of the MAGA world. And, you know, one point, if I mention related to this, because I know that this is a topic you've really honed in on as well regarding fraudulent elections. Now, again, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to say that there's a, there is a both sides to this. I, I always like to caution with both sides, and I'm not putting words in your mouth here, this is me speaking. I always caution with both sides that sometimes the problem with both sides' narratives is that they can often imply that something happens with equal frequency. It is accurate to say that there was, from the Democratic Party side, that there, was, there were very visible leaders saying that Trump was not a legitimate president. Now, we know that the Russians did try to interfere in the election, just like many other foreign nations have tried to interfere many, many times in, in past elections. So while it, and I'm going to say this to someone who came out of MAGA, even though the Russians did attempt to interfere, well, they shouldn't say attempt, they did interfere with our elections, that interference did not affect the outcome. There's no evidence. There, there isn't. There is, but, I, but, but I'll give something that I would say at least has some anecdotal evidence to it. And again, it's a bit of a what if. I think that when Hillary Clinton made her deplorables comment, Trump gained enough votes in the immediate aftermath of that to win the election. Mm-hmm. I, I believe that. I believe that her statement of deplorable impacted the, the election far more than, di- than anything that the Russians did. You can find, you know, I talk about this in my book is like there's studies that show. Uh, yeah, that this is a whole discussion, but there's studies that show it was the their things they did were a drop in the bucket compared to, you know, all the social media that was out there. And also the meta level point of like, if you're going to claim an election is illegitimate just because somebody tried to influence it outside your country, then that basically just allows anyone to attempt any manipulation of your of your population's thoughts. And that therefore, you will, from that point on, be susceptible to call any ele- election illegitimate. Right. You're just playing into the hands of people who want – that's probably their goal anyway, is to make you distrust the, the elections. And, and I, I will, again, acknowledge that some of my – I'm not trying to position myself as my voice is the only one who matters because I was in MAGA and I came out of it. But having been in it, it's why I have these strong feelings about about what the Republican Party has become. Now, some will argue the Republican Party has always been this way. I don't think that that's an entirely incorrect argument. But again, I think it's lacking some nuance in terms of how that's stated. 
But it's especially lacking the fact that we've become increasingly, you know, us versus them animosity exactly. polarized exactly. over the last, you know, just in the last couple of deca- decades substantially. So then, you know, it leaves out that big part of it. Yeah. I mean, I offer some, I'll offer here for listeners some fly on the wall conversations that happened in, in my, when, when MAGA voters, fellow MAGA voters and I had congregated. And, and I'm speaking, I have to say, I'm speaking only from my own experience because if anyone else out there in MAGA has a, has a different experience or decides to have the experience they want to have, I, I put it that way, I, my, my experience in, in the MAGA world was, if we take, for example, the issue of race, there was a belief amongst those I was around that, that the Democratic Party was salivating over the inevitable, the imminent rendering of white people as a minority. And they viewed that as back to this point of the Democrats were going to own America, that, that so drove my support of Trump. This was very much a prevalent belief amongst those I was around. It was, oh, we're going to be, once we become the minority, we're already a nation in decline. And we're, we're just, it's going to be, America is going to be fundamentally transformed. If we're not already, we will be once white people become a minority. That was a common belief. To some extent, I did believe that because I was, I was still in that mindset of they want to render me irrelevant. Mm-hmm. They, the Democrats want to render me irrelevant because I'm not a Democrat. Thus, I don't matter to them. So that part of the discussion, I did relate to it in that sense. Now, when it came to other matters of race, there were one of the other common discussions that I that I would have was when we would talk about black Americans in history. Those I was around, I, I, I didn't hear statements like, oh, slavery was actually good. And it's it. Well, you know, slavery was bad, but it had its upsides also. I didn't really have those discussions. But what I would hear were comments such as, look, slavery was bad. We didn't treat black people well, but that was hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Get over it. And I heard that a lot. Now, by the way, did I actually did I actually think that? Yeah, for the most part, I did. I thought, OK, yes, it's true. Historically, we didn't treat black people well, but we've made uh, but we've made a lot of progress. And I'm going to get back to that point in a moment, if I may. But, yeah, we've made a lot of progress. There was also some discussion sometimes of the LGBTQ Americans and okay, they, they, have, they can get married now. They have their rights. Why do they have to shove it in our faces? Why do we need to have, have uh, you know, gay pride parades? And, these, and, and there, was that, there was that feeling. And it comes back to, to a point that I like to, to mention in trying to understand why some of these mythologies are so, are so effective. There, there is a contradiction here because naturally, like we were saying before, how we're, we are very much resistant to acknowledging we're wrong. There is also a part of our, of our DNA where we don't generally like change, especially if it's rapid change. But here's why perception, understanding these issues in a, in a perception way versus a reality way is so important. If you look at our history, it took Black Americans a century to essentially get civil rights and equality constitutionally under the law. Post-Civil War, 1865 to 1965, and 64 and 65 with the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. Now, some might argue it was going all the way back to the beginning of the country. That's a fair argument, but let's just look at 1865 to 1965. So it took 100 years. That's not a rapid change. If we think about gay Americans, gay and lesbian, LGBTQ Americans, the first gay rights organization was, 19, was founded in 1924. The Obergefell Supreme Court ruling that, that, that said, yes, con- that ruled constitutional, that ma- gay marriage is constitutional, it's allowed, states cannot prohibit it. That was in 2015, almost a century. So when we think about the mythologies of, of telling people, look how rapidly everything's changing, our culture's eroding, our values are eroding, we're becoming less white, we're becoming less heterosexual, we're becoming less, uh, less religious, more, more secular, more diverse. These feed into the natural instincts that we have of being against change. And they are effective. And that's why so many of the conversations I had were centered upon these social issues. Because here's, here's something that's unique about social. And by social, I mean anything that has to do with race, and sex and marriage is that these are very, very visual topics. We can see more religious diversity. We can see fewer attendees at church. We can see 
more gay people. We can see more, we can see immigrants coming in, thus less of a white population. So because we can see those, it's not policy, it's not sitting around debating the, the nuances of the Affordable Care Act or the nuances of some other bill. We can actually see those. And I think that those, the natural fears that we have are very much exploited by a lot of the right-wing mythologies. Some of the things you just talked about reminded me of something I read about the, the concept is well explained in this book about conflict and conflict resolution. It's called the anatomy of peace. And it talked about how in a conflict dynamic, we can induce the very behaviors that we dislike on the, in the other side, like the things that we see about them that we dislike, there can be a dynamic where we bring those behaviors out of them. So for example, that would mean, you know, if, if Democrats focus a lot on race, uh, the dynamic might be in one part of it anyway. Conservatives will will view those the things that liberals say about race through the worst possible interpretation, right? Right. In addition to that, they're also going to want to trigger them a bit and want to bother them about those things, even if they're not racist or whatever. It's just like, well, if you care about that, then you know we're going to see it as like your your pro immigration stances have some malicious underpinning of of wanting to increase Democrat voters or or whatever it may be. And we're also going to criticize you because we know it matters to you. And we could take that on any in, any topic, really. And, and, and in the book, Anatomy of Peace, it talks about this in the context, not just of big political or cultural divides. It talks about it in like marriages or, or fights, you know, interpersonal fights. It's like we can bring out the very behaviors that we most dislike about the other side or the other person, you know, and I think that's a big part of these things. Any, any conflict is like when, when you call, if you call Trump supporters racist, they're going to focus on that and, and be more likely to behave in ways that seem racist, if that makes sense. Do you see some of that, that dynamic going on? Absolutely. It's so true, it's so true what you're saying, because if you think about this, if you think about the, 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 the vitriol that is lobbed at, Trump voters, putting them all under one umbrella, saying they're all racist. Well, what those who are saying that are actually empowering the very people that they dislike and disdain. To your point, it's, it, it's actually when we would hear that, when we'd hear we're racist and we would hear whatever it was, whatever, whatever insult wanted to be lobbed at us, it just made we just we just fought harder. And it creates a group alignment, right? It's like you start feeling like, well, my brethren over here in this group who may not be, you know, previously before I had so much animosity towards the other side or something. Now I feel like a solidarity with them because we're all being called racist or whatever it is, you know, so it creates this group solidarity, which actually strengthens, strengthens the extremity of, of the group. If I was going to try to wrap up a lot of what we talked about, I think you know, I, I try I try to think of these things on like two different dimensions. It's like our beliefs, you know, our political beliefs are, are, are the things we believe are right and wrong. And then there's the dimension on top of that, which is like the amount of anger and animosity we have about those things, you know? So it's like we can disagree on all sorts of things as we should and always will. But then it's the us versus them animosity and contempt, which, you know, it, when when you described your process of coming out of the, you know, of the us versus them contempt, it's, it's like the doubt and, and skepticism of one's views start to creep in a, a healthy doubt, you know, because I think what drives so much of the, the us versus them contempt is, you know, this high certainty that I know exactly what is right and wrong, right? To get out of that, you have to have some, some self doubt, you have to be like, Am I right on all these issues? Like, did I get led astray? Is it possible I let it? Um, I was led astray. But the people that the nature of extremism is that we believe we know exactly what's going yeah. on. We know the playing field. We know who the good and the bad guys are. So, you know what you were describing. I think I think some people might listen to your description of of getting out of the mega world and think like, well, I I don't agree with you know what you said about COVID or whatever. But I think that's missing the broader point of like regardless of what you believed, really, like you could have, your animosity could have changed it no matter what your beliefs were. But I think what, what is the meta level thing is the, the doubt was creeping in and you were willing, you were able to see it from a, a more uncertain perspective, as opposed to like filtering everything through the most certain perspectives. I think that's important because I think some people might 
try to toss away what you're saying is being like, well, I disagreed with him on this and this and this. And then to me, like the actual beliefs aren't, don't even really matter. It's like, it's just the fact that there was some doubt and uncertainty creeping in. Right. And, and if I could just, uh, something on that point, it's something I, I, I always like to mention me going so public with this. I, I actually, to some extent, Zach, understand why some might be suspicious of this. And, and it's not that I went MAGA to, um, let me think, I went MAGA to the far other side of the pendulum. Like it swung from far right to all the way far left. In fact, I'm, I'm actually not, I'm registered to vote. I'm not registered with any party. And sometimes I wonder maybe just subconsciously that maybe I've avoided getting deeply involved in Democratic Party groups and clubs and all that sort. Maybe I'm afraid of getting totally absorbed into that also. And I, mm. I feel like I feel like staying I don't want to say I'm in the middle because on certain issues I probably lean uh, maybe center left and on other issues I lean center right. I carry a firearm every day unless we're prohibited by law. A lot of people hear that and think, well, that's uh, how, how do you how do you rec again, how do you reconcile that? Even though I think firearm laws are decades lagging and I'm actually writing an article that's gonna publish probably next week about just about firearms overall and how I, as a firearm owner, I, I see the Second Amendment as it, the Second Amendment is unnecessarily killing people. And I'm not saying that's the fault of James Madison, but I don't believe the founders. That if I'm going to do something I don't like to do, I'm going to speak for, I'm not, I'm loath to do it. I, I think if the framers were alive today, right now, they would not ratify a Second Amendment. I don't believe that they would. But that's a different discussion with that, and I'm going to run. The point is you're a complex person with, yeah, like, 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 almost everybody, <laughs> unless you're super, right. you know, us. Right. I think I think the point is, like, most people have these nuanced views on a bunch of things, and that that uh, that that's what prevents them from being, like, entirely subsumed into an us versus them, like, simplistic mentality. Yeah. But the more anger you have, the more you, you know, it's not that, it's not that you actually believe all the things on your side. It's more like the us versus them anger becomes the most important thing so therefore all those nuances don't really matter that much anymore right? I, I don't i don't want to make myself sound like uh, uh you know like tony robbins here you know awaken the giant within you but as part of my as part of my overall healing even though i understand why some might be suspicious i do understand that why they might they might with some skepticism look at my my life now all i can do zach is just publicize this, what I went through, and as part of my own healing and reconciliation, which is a very, very individual process to go through, I have forgiven myself for what I see as being someone I wasn't. That's an important point for me because if I'm going to go and ask others to, to humanize others, to try to understand others' motivations for what they did. You don't have to agree, but to, to try to understand that. I can't ask others to do that, that form of healing, that form of reconciliation, if I haven't done it for myself. And as part of moving forward, I'm, to, to quote the book of Isaiah, even though I'm not the most religious Catholic, in fact, if I lived hundreds of years ago, they probably, the Vatican would have probably excommunicated me. But to quote the book of Isaiah, I am trying to bring good news to the afflicted. And Trump voters, MAGA voters, will probably disagree with this next statement, but I believe it to be true based on my experience. Deep down, they're good people, but I believe that they have been victimized, traumatized, and exploited. I believe that their concerns are valid, just as I think mine were, but the difference is that Trump did not come in looking to resolve these problems in a, in a democratic lowercase d way. I believe that he saw these concerns, which were valid concerns, and he and he leveraged them against the very people he was trying to appeal to and earn their votes. And I know that MAGA voters might say, you know, F you rich, I'm not victimized, you know, you're victimized. It's like people inside of a of a cult. And I and I sometimes act do I, I agree with your point that you've made in the past about the language of cult and, and how it can demean people. I respect that point. I refer to my own experience as, as the MAGA cult because the way I define cult, and I know there's, a, there's others out there who can more sociologically, clinically define it. The reason I call it a MAGA, the, for me, MAGA was a cult is because everything in my life was consumed by it. My personal life, my professional life, 
my worldview. When I woke up, I thought about it. I went through my day thinking about it. I went to bed at night thinking about it. It is not a healthy way to live. It simply isn't. It's like uh, you would you would see it as a as a cult of anger because it's like some cults don't necessarily involve anger, but you can have a cult based on I had rage anger. At, at least that, that's how you. I, would I had it. rage. Yeah. Anyone who would read my right wing right my former right wing writings, and they were in Fox, The Federalist, uh, American Thinker, American Greatness. Anyone who would read those stories will see a very very rageful, angry person. I want to emphasize that moving forward. Tens and tens and tens of millions of Americans, we cannot perpetually pit ourselves against where you have tens and tens and tens of millions of Americans pitted against tens and tens and tens of other million Americans. That type of us versus them polarization is it just it doesn't just weaken democracy. It's perhaps even fatal for democracy. And again, I'm not trying to make this sound hyperbolic, but. There's a reason that John Adams wrote when he did after our founding that in history, every democracy eventually commits suicide. And our country, despite our flaws like everywhere else, we have a really great track record of forming unlikely but necessary alliances when the moment calls for it. The reason that I'm going to vote Democrat next year as I did last year is not because I want a one party system. I feel like I have to be transparent about how I vote here. Even though people will say it's not your business, I respect that. I'm offering it. I am not going to support Democrats because I agree with every policy position and, be, and because I, I think that everything they've done is great and everything that they say is great. No, I'm doing it because I think that the Republican Party in its current iteration is a party that does have to be mercy killed. I, I don't believe that it's a party any longer. And I'm not saying all Republicans. Again, I want to be I want to be very very clear in my language, but I don't think that the I believe that the Republican Party, deep down, the leadership of the party knows that their political offering has become, at best, probably a niche product. Mm -hmm. Do you think the ideas need to fade away, sort of like Nixon's support needed to fade away? You know, that that kind of I, thing. Yeah. I, I think if it's if the Republican Party is mercy killed next year. That gives an opportunity for many, many responsible and respectable and, and impassioned Republicans to start something new. And we are about to ha we're about to come into a political realignment, and I think it's going to happen from unlikely but necessary alliances. But I'm imploring everyone out there that when they think about Trump voters, I'm asking you, please, do not dehumanize them. They are, they are our fellow countrymen and women. Had good reasons for supporting Trump the way that they did. Yes, I think Trump was one of the more one of the more egregious mistakes in our history. I think that those two statements, those that can coexist. I think we can look at Trump voters and say deep down they're good people for the most part, but also acknowledge what I what I acknowledge and have come to conclude is that Trump is 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 a person who cannot ever, ever wield any level lever of power ever, ever again. And so that is the reason why I'm going to vote. The way that I am. It is not because I want a one party system. It is because I want a healthier two party system. And so as I try to bring good news to the afflicted, what I'm asking those out there who who whose knee jerk reaction to Trump voters is to is to hate them and 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 impugn their integrity with the with the worst types of insults, I'm asking them to be patient in their own affliction, as the book of Romans says. I'm not trying to make this sound with, with doe-eyed optimism, but I, I, we've gone through many phases in our history with tumult and conflict. And, and I have faith in the American people that we can start to come out of this. It'll take time, like everything in our history, anytime there's progress, it's always accompanied always by struggle. But the, the moment in our history calls for it right now. And while this will be very, very difficult work, I do think, Zach, that when we I look at next year as a, such a pivotal moment because I think we're going to have a safe landing, but I think it's going to be a turbulent flight because I think it'll be a turbulent. If you notice, if you're on a plane and it's a turbulent flight, uh, we don't remember the safe landing. We remember the turbulent flight, but I think we're going to have, I think we're going to have a safe landing next year because I do believe in the goodness of people. And I think more and more people are going to begin to start to feel some of that remorse for supporting Trump and MAGA. Now, I understand why they'd be ambivalent about speaking up, 
for those out there listening who might feel that way, I want you to know that part of the reason I'm doing this is so you'll feel more empowered to publicly speak up if you are feeling that remorse and regret. And I'm saying that as non-judgmentally, Zach, as I possibly can. So I, I want to just, I want to make sure I emphasize on a very positive, forward-looking note what I see is going to happen and what I think needs to happen going forward. And one other angle on this that I would say, like if there's Trump voters listening to this, I think the case I try to make to people on, uh, to both Democrats and Republicans about this kind of stuff, the depolarization angle is that I think the reason people should want to reduce their rage and contempt, the reason that they should want to see it as important is because the more rage and contempt we have, it actually helps create some of the very things that we're angry about. So let's say, for example, I, I think it's entirely possible to imagine somebody who had the exact same stances of Trump, like let's say the same goals and political beliefs and such, but was able to speak in a persuasive and non-angry way and actually suffer the the slings and arrows of people and and actually try to convince people of his beliefs, right? I think you would actually for people that wanted those things, they would actually be more likely to achieve those goals. You know, for example, we can look at when Trump was elected, when we talk about the the great increase in rage on both sides, you know, you can see a big upward swing in like people signing up for Democrat Socialist uh, Party, whatever, I can't remember their exact name, but you can see that increase. You can see an increase in pro-immigration stances, including like some open borders type stances and such these kinds of things. And, and, and we can see that as a result of how Trump behaved, like his belligerence, his insults, yes. far from being, it, it's not an effective strategy. It actually helps create pushback to the stances and, and to Republican stances in general. So I like to emphasize that because it's like, even if you fully support a lot of those things, it's like seeing how the way we treat other people actually create an impediment to us uh, achieving what we want, right? It's like, to me, the taking the depolarizing conflict resolution approaches are, are actually like a very powerful political activism to have in your arsenal. They're actually very powerful things to do as opposed to, you know, some people would say like, no, I want to, somebody who fights hard and, 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 and insults people and tells it like it is. But it's like, to me, that's just like creating the pushback that prevents you from actually like getting what you want. I understand to a large degree why many left-leaning Democrat voters, maybe center left or, or, or those who maybe would, would consider themselves down the middle centrist Democrat voters. I understand why they feel traumatized by Trump. I've seen it, as I mentioned earlier, with these comments, some of the comments I've received. Those individuals don't know me. They are saying what they say, not really against me it's just a it's a manifestation of their own political trauma so that's why i don't take it personal right i i know where it's coming from you've been, I've there. been there right i was there i called them i called democrats malignant that was actual language that i used i i cannot imagine a more dehumanizing adjective than to call someone malignant that's what i thought and i was on a twitter spaces the other night and I was emphasized, and I've never been on a Twitter space, so that was, let's just say, a unique experience, but for, the, for a good unique experience. And I kept emphasizing, Zach, this point about MAGA people being good people. Resist the temptation to be us first them, because we all have it. I respect that, but resist it. A lady wrote me afterwards and told me that her father had died in 2017. They were not on good terms because of the 2016 election. Her father was a ardent Trump supporter and she wasn't. And they had a big argument at Christmas and her father had told her, you ruined my Christmas. It was a, because Trump had won by that point, right? It was in December. So Trump was going to be president. And this lady told me afterwards, this Twitter spaces that hearing me, and I'm not trying to take credit for this, please understand. But she said that after hearing me, she was able to make peace with some of the anger that she felt from the, the fact that her relationship had been torn asunder with her father. And, and she said to me, she, she said he was a good man. He had a tough upbringing. He was complicated, but he was a good man deep down. And she told me, 
I now have peace because of listening to you. Hmm. I was speechless when she wrote that to me. I, I, I just didn't know what to say. I, I just thought, what can I possibly say that, that, that somehow tops that? But it did, it did serve as a reminder that I want my work to be in a positive way, purposeful. I think your work, it's purposeful. Its goals are ambitious. Because I think that real positive change and healing and reconciliation, it can only come from ambitious goals. If I can, I'm not saying I'm the, the leading voice on this. I'm just a regular, everyday uh, dad and, and husband and, and small business owner. I'm, I, I don't come from means. I just have my own experience. And, and hearing that and listening to others on this Twitter spaces, receiving so many of these comments, you know, the opportunity to speak with you tonight and have a diverse audience hear this. I'm hoping that if there are others out there who are dealing with some of the MAGA related trauma, whether they were in MAGA or they know others who were, the stories you hear all the time about my mother, my father, my brother, they're in the rabbit hole. I can't, what do I say? What do I do? I just look at so many I was around. And they are they they experience on a day to day basis that Thoreauvian life of quiet desperation. If if we if we lack the empathy, if we lack the understanding, then what that is going to mean in the end is that this, as I call it, this political trauma, the white hot rage, all of them would have won. Those are the winners if we cannot figure out ways to overcome all of those. The, the nefarious aspects that have so seeped into our national politics. I, I don't see this as optional. I don't see it as theoretical. I don't see it as we'll get around to it. This is going to be healing and reconciliation and depolarization is going to be amongst the most important civic work that people are going to engage in. And we are going to need people to lead it. And again, I'm not saying I'm a leader, but I want to make a positive contribution because I look at a lot of what I did and I believe I contributed to the problem. And now I want to be a contributor to the solutions. That was a talk with Rich Logis. His last name is spelled L-O-G-I-S. You can learn more about Rich at his site, perfectourunion.us. And you can search for his name online to find various pieces he's written. One prominent topic Rich and I didn't get a chance to talk about was transgender issues. Some conservatives would say this is the most important and most divisive issue currently. I can't speak for Rich on this and what he'd say, but I did want to mention that I had a previous episode about transgender topics, which was an attempt to help liberals see some of the more rational and well-meaning aspects of conservative side thought on that. And in my book, Diffusing American Anger, I examine both sides of that topic from a depolarizing angle. This has been the People Who Read People podcast with me, Zachary Elwood. You can learn more about it at behavior-podcast.com. If you like the work I'm doing and want to support it, you can sign up at that site to get a premium subscription. If you're interested in my polarization-related work specifically, you can sign up for my Substack newsletter, which you can find links to from my podcast site. Thanks for listening. Music by Small Skies.